Thank you. Um, so everyone can hear me with the mic. Um, so I'm the director of legal initiatives at the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity. We're a nonprofit at Yale, and we're a multidisciplinary center. I think it's the only one of its kind. Uh, we have economists, policy people, psychologists. We uh, they run studies. I'm I'm a lawyer, um, and we try to come up with uh, promising ways to change the modern food environment, basically to address obesity. And we also work on weight stigma issues. Um, so I'll be talking about the modern food environment and tell you some marketing practices that the processed food companies do, especially um, a lot of parents don't realize what their children see on TV, uh, what, what happens in the supermarket. And then I'll talk about the regulatory authority of some of the agencies and their lack thereof, um, and some state and local ways to address food. And I, I'm going to tell you about some of the policy options that are all, all in the news now, like Mayor Bloomberg's serving size restriction and uh, sugary beverage taxes, and then removing sugary beverages from the SNAP, uh, which is formerly called food stamps. Um, so that that's basically my talk. But um, just to start out, uh, there are about 300,000 processed food items on store shelves today, and every year 12,000 new products are introduced. Um, these products benefit from the corn and soy subsidies, but economists don't think that's the sole reason for their, um, their cheapness. It's more about the high production ability of modern technology and modern uh, machines. But nonetheless, we have... Uh, we're inundated in this country with just processed food that are primarily made of corn, soy, and sugar. Um, and you could see this from um, from uh, in stores and and in fast food restaurants and convenience stores. And the Rudd Center has done um, three reports. This it's called Cereal Facts, Sugary Beverage Facts, and Fast Food Facts. So if you want any of the information or more information about what I'm talking about, you could find it on our website. Um, so. The fascinating thing are studies after studies and after studies show that the same group of food is problematic for several reasons. They're most associated with weight gain. They're the most uh, purchased at fast food restaurants, um, the most snacked on by U.S. adults, and they have very high sugar and sodium content. And it's the same list. Uh, candy's not always on every list, but it's on the high sugar um, snack food list and um, the, the and as you can see, it's processed foods, the French fries, chips, sugary beverages, processed meats, the kind that are at the McDonald's that I showed you, um, sweet desserts, refined grains, which are like the sugary cereals, uh, and juice drinks. And so these are the products that are have basically inundated society, and unfortunately, they're also the most marketed to children. Um, so these, the FTC did a study. Uh, they're actually supposed to come out with a new study. That's the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, the same group of foods are the same uh, that are most marketed ch to children, and in many venues, um, television. It, if they measured this by expenditure, but if you look at it. Digital, even though digital is the fourth uh, on the list, the impact is quite high for how small the amount that they have to pay for. So the digital marketing on the internet and now mobile phones, that's the new horizon where there are banner ads on children's websites and then, of course, lots of children's websites that are actually just dedicated to the brand and the product and children play with the product and it becomes a game and they don't realize that they're, they're actually being marketed to while being on the websites. Um, so a lot, study after study also shows that the, the impact is that it's teaching our kids that it's, it's cool and fun to eat unhealthy food anywhere, anytime, and the, that's a message that's definitely coming through, and there, there's no repercussion. The kids on the commercials are not obese, they're not sick, they don't have cavities, they're happy young kids running around. Um, and they promote exercise as their, their way to say, you can eat anything you want if you exercise, and we all know that this is not true. Um, so I would like to show you some marketing practices, uh, but first I do want to give you like a one second background on why in the U.S. we allow marketing to children. Um, other countries have tried to restrict it. The World Health Organization, the Institute of Medicine, American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Psychological Associations, they all recommend limiting marketing of unhealthy food to children. But the U.S., we focus on self-regulation. And for the non-lawyers in the room, it's because we have a First Amendment and other countries don't. And our First Amendment 
um, it says that Congress shall make no law bridging the freedom of speech. And the original purpose for this was to protect political speech, political discourse, religious speech. So you were really could participate in the marketplace of ideas. There was nothing, no wrong ideas and everyone could debate. But in the 1970s, the Supreme Court determined that the um, First Amendment protected commercial speech, which is advertising. And unfortunately, since then, the Supreme Court has been interpreting this much more strictly um, to protect more and more commercial speech. It's very hard for the government to restrict commercial speech, except um, in schools, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so, so this is why it's hard for our, our government to restrict marketing to children. Um, false and deceptive commercial speech is not protected by the First Amendment, so this is where our agencies come in to protect consumers, uh, and I'll show you an example of that. But we will be talking about um, commercial speech here. So we, we just came out with a cereal facts study that showed that the number one packaged food kids see is cereals. Um, the kids are seeing 1.6 to almost two ads a day for cereal. And uh, this is a great photo from CSPI just showing that the 30 grams of uh, cookies are identical to 31 grams of this cookie crisp. And um, in fact, it turns out that over 90% 90, 90 of the ads that kids see for cereals are um, comprised of 26% sugar or more. And it's not that the companies don't have other products because they market healthy products to adults and the family range like Cheerios, um, but they really market the most unhealthy products to children. And this is, this is the great slide that my marketing team put um, together. They had studied whether there had been a change from 2008 to 2010, because the companies are all telling us that they're self-regulating. We don't need to have any government intervention. We're taking care of it. And so these were the top uh, 10 cereals marketed to children in 2008. And in 2010, this was the change. So here they tell us they're doing their job. Government doesn't need to regulate. And these are still the top 10 mar uh, were m m cereals marketed to children. And these are all the cereals that the companies say meet their better for you standards. These are healthy. I mean, and I just have to point out Reese's Puffs. And, uh, and also, please note that so for Reese's Puffs is a great example. There's health claims on the top of that. And if, when you go into the store, you'll see it. And here's where it gets really tricky. This, these are the cereals that they tell you are they're okay to market to your children on TV. When you go into a supermarket, there, it's not like you know now which is the one that's better for you compared to the one that's not better for you. The kid requests one, you you know they've seen a commercial for it. So when once you get into the retail environment, it's really irrelevant what they've decided to say is better for you and not better for you. And if you'll note again, there are health claims on both of these cereals. Um, <coughs> Now the fast food companies are using a new strategy to tell us that they're not marketing to our children on healthy food. Instead of showing hamburgers and french fries, they're branding their companies and the products and tell us about the toys. So now it's actually, turns out it's probably a better marketing me method um, by getting kids just wanting to go to McDonald's. They don't care what the food is. It's about the toy and the, the branding of McDonald's. Um, and then sugary beverages are, are the other product. Um, kids are seeing more ads for sugary beverages than they did in 2008. Unfortunately, these are products that have unhealthy amounts of caffeine for young children to be consuming. And, and kids are seeing ads for energy drinks and energy shots to the same rate as adults are. So th this is becoming a real big problem. There are now emergency room visits of energy drink overdoses of, in, in teenagers and not being combined with alcohol, but literally caffeine toxicity. Um, and then they have high sugar content as well. Uh, and also one thing that was shocking that we found was that some of the regular drinks that don't label the, anything, they had artificial um, sweeteners in them also. So I think that would be surprising to parents that would normally think it would say diet or light. Um, so uh, the other problem is that these drinks are marketed with healthy features. And 68% of parents in one of the surveys we did said that they want healthy features such as um, vitamin C and the term all natural. And they look for this and they'll purchase it for their children. We have no vitamin C deficiency in the country. And in fact, so many things are fortified with vitamin C, it's, it's impossible not to be getting enough vitamin C. Um, 
And even you, you, if you eat whole foods, you're getting enough vitamin C. And then, interestingly, this all-natural term has really no meaning. Uh, the FDA has declined to have a definition for all-natural. The only thing it's FDA has said, uh, that's the Food and Drug Administration. They're responsible for pa package labeling, which I'll talk about in a minute. The only thing they've said is that it shouldn't have added color, synthetic substances, or flavors. But then there are lo lawsuits all over what the term all-natural means. Um, consumers suing Snapple, your product had high fructose corn syrup, that's not all natural. Well, there really is no definition. So when parents are, and consumers are looking at the all natural label, it means nothing. So don't be tricked by that. Um, and then the last thing is schools. 90% uh, of all the ads that are, the kids are seeing in schools are for sugary beverages. There are many venues within the school environment. Um, and the one good news in this whole bad news scenario I just gave you is that if you uh, are interested in working in your community, it's the one area you can restrict marketing. Um, Schools are government property. I'm talking about public schools only. So that's called a non-public forum in First Amendment terms. And the government can re regulate schools. Um, it's recognized that children are a captive audience in schools and that they understand that what's being told to them at school is, is different than just in the community. They take it for a learning. Um, so, you, so schools can contract away for ads. They, if they have a vending contract with, say, Pepsi, they can tell Pepsi, that's fine if you bring your water into our schools, but you can't advertise for anything else. And the other way is you can actually enact guidelines. It's called viewpoint neutral guidelines. Um, and, um, and the whole purpose is to reserve the property for its lawfully dedicated use. Unfortunately, a new practice is springing up where schools are now selling marketing space on their school buses. This is all over the country. Um, if, if you are interested in, in trying to restrict that in your school, I have a paper that just came out in American Journal of Public Health that is really a practical tool to tell uh, people what to do to get, get that out of their schools. Um, so when we talk about addressing this environment, the Food and Drug Inv Administration is in charge of labels. Uh, they, they, they have the regulations for the nutrition facts panel, ingredient lists, and health, uh, health claims. Um, and the one thing, there's a lot of things missing in the regulations. Um, they have a disqualifying level for health claims for fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, and sodium, but there are no disqualifying levels for sugar and added sugar. So remember all those health claims I was telling you were on those sugary beverages and on the cereals? This is why. It's the only product, these are the only products that now can keep having health claims. Unfortunately, our studies have shown that parents are really swayed by these, and consumers in general are swayed by health claims, and they do purchase products they might not otherwise purchase if they had known the that the, there's no disqualifying level of sugar. Um, also, there's no required caffeine disclosure, so energy drinks uh, can have as much caffeine and not tell consumers how, how much is in there. Um, the one bright spot is the FDA is researching right now. Um, they just put a call for uh, comments about whether they sh should research adding added sugar on the nutrition facts panel. So that's, that's a bright spot, and hopefully that'll be true. So as everyone knows, you, the beverages get a nutrition facts panel. Um, but what's going on with these energy drinks? There's a lot of energy drinks that are saying they're supplements, they have, and they have dietary supplement labels. Well, that's illegal. Uh, they do it anyway. The FDA sends them letters, and um, uh, they, they don't have much recourse. It's, what, misbranding is illegal under the regulations, but the FDA doesn't have so much authority to address this. Um, they can see, they send warning labels and they basically say, we're seeking assurance that you're going to change your label. Um, but they can't if issue civil monetary fines. Uh, they can't obtain substantiation documents. So if a company puts some false claim, the FDA does not actually have the authority to say, can, give us your documents to support this claim, which to me is, is, a, is crazy. So if they want to go after a claim, they actually have to do their own studies. Now, they don't have all the money in the world to do the studies to prove that a, a company's claim is not valid. And there's no pre-approval for structure function claims. And so what this means is even though health claims and nutrient content claims have to be pre-approved or they go through, they uh, have to abide by certain regulations, the structure function claims can basically say anything as long as it's truthful. Uh, and so there's where we run into a problem. So FTA has had, has, writes letters to companies. These are two examples of, of letters, of company, I'm sorry, of products that have gotten 
letters because uh, of their labeling. Diet Coke Plus is in direct contradiction to a regulation that says you're not allowed to fortify a soda. And they have lawyers at Coke, so they they knew what they were doing. Um, and they got a letter being told to stop with this. And um, Juicy Juice is really interesting. Juicy Juice is intended for ch children under two, but the regulations say you can't have certain claims for children under two, yet they did it. Yet, if you notice, there says brain development on there. Well, the F, that's considered a structure function claim. So even though the FDA wrote this long letter to Juicy Juice about their no sugar added claims and their fruit claims, they don't even mention brain development, which is obviously the worst claim on this packaging because it's a structure function claim. So we're a little lucky. The FTC has better authority, and they've been able to fill some of the gaps. The uh, FTC is in charge of marketing, while the FDA was labels. This is marketing, so TV, internet, radio. Uh, they can issue civil monetary penalties for certain uh, practices. They can obtain substantiation documents, and they can go after structure function claims. So when Coco Krispies uh, had these immunity claims during uh, the swine flu scare, and parents were apparently buying this thinking it would keep their kids from getting regular colds and swine flu, the FTC was able to go after them, told them to stop um, th these, uh, these practices. So that's the, a quick background of the regulatory environment that's going on at the federal level. And I want to talk a little about the local level and then tell you about some of the news, uh, the stories you've heard about regulation that's going on. Um, so local level is basically retail food service establishments. Local jurisdictions, meaning state and local governments, have authority over public health, safety, and welfare. Um, they they would we're, i'm talking now about not not restricting advertising but regulating conduct which is um not protected by the first amendment governments can regulate conduct easier than speech in the u.s um so what happens is a lot of times a government will try to restrict marketing of an unhealthy product to protect children one of the most famous supreme court cases came out of massachusetts there was a, a restriction on the ad for tobacco products so uh, near schools. The Supreme Court struck down most of the restrictions, and this happens a lot for alcohol, tobacco, but often the, when the Supreme Court strikes down a restriction, it offers ideas of what the government could have done instead if they would regulate conduct. And we can learn from these ideas and implement them for food. Um, they had suggested limiting per capita purchases of products, banning or limiting harmful ingredients, age limits to purchase, possess, or use products, restrict location, um, increase information about the products, and then raise the price. And so we've seen this. These are things that are enacted uh, all the time. In the ephedrine containing cold medicine is um, a per capita restriction. You can't buy many at a time. You have to sign it out. In many states, um, you can't just buy it because it was, it's used to make meth. Um, some states have banned the product called Four Loco, which is a caffeinated alcohol drink. Uh, actually, I live in New York, and New York banned it quite a while ago, and I just saw it in the bodega down the street from me, so I don't know how effective that ban was, but it is banned. Um, as you know, minors can't purchase alcohol and tobacco, um, and tobacco can be placed, uh, requires to be placed behind the counter. That was something that did come out of the Massachusetts case, that retailers can be required to place tobacco behind the counter so kids can't just get uh, cigarettes. With, and um, the California enacted a law saying that uh, tobacco can't be sold out of pharmacies, and the Ninth Circuit upheld this and said this is a, just a direct regulation of conduct and it has nothing to do with marketing. Uh, menu labeling laws, if your state doesn't have them or your city doesn't have them, it's a national law. Um, our understanding is that the Obama administration is waiting till the next uh, election to actually enforce the law. But um, that it, it has been implemented in many places where there are calorie counts are on the, on the fast food menu. And then Every state in the country and the federal government has an excise tax on tobacco products. So these are all in practice. And now we can see it apply to sugary beverages, and this is starting to go on. Um, I've done this talk, this, uh, this part of the talk for years, and I've had to add and add and add to the list, which is exciting news because local governments are starting to get on board. Um, I haven't heard of any governments trying to limit per capita purchase. That doesn't sound very politically feasible. Um, but we have seen serving size uh, limits, which I, I do have a whole slide on New York City. But New York City is trying to enact a serving size limit on sugary beverages. Cambridge, Massachusetts are actually talking about it uh, and also considering just 
um, trying to work with the vendors to only have a certain serving size. Um, and Oregon had a bill that failed. Uh, you can restrict the sale of certain drinks. In Connecticut, the attorney general didn't want the energy drink called cocaine to be sold in the state because they felt like it was marketing drugs. And they talked to the company and said, you're not, you can't come in our state, and they're not. But you could also do this through legislation. Um, there, was a, there was a local uh, politician in New York who tried to enact an age limit so nobody under 19 could purchase an sh- uh, energy drink that it didn't pass. Um, and then there, is, there was a bill in New York about uh, junk food free checkout aisles. This is one that we've, we talk about a lot at the Rudd Center. It, it would be very easy to enact that in the checkout aisle, you can't have it inundated with all the candy and junk. Um, but then the pharmacy ban is another idea. Um, and then factual signs at the checkout, Boston, I guess, I, you know, I haven't even seen it here, but apparently they have signs at certain checkout. Um, and, but you could do creative, you could say how many calories or caffeine is in a product or how much exercise time it would take to burn off the calories, which I'm not in love with just because I don't think that is really the compensation. But this was an idea floated by one of the commissioners at the FTC. Um, and then, of course, degree beverage taxes. So just um, here's one of the signs from Boston. Um, I haven't seen these two. Has anyone seen that? Anyway, it's mostly in some retail establishments. Um, and so the serving size restriction. So this is a, um, a really interesting idea. Mayor Bloomberg announced it in New York City that no um, food service establishment could sell sugary beverages that were... Um, larger than 16 ounces and the in New York City the health department has a lot of regulatory authority not every health department in the state or um, in state health departments or city health departments have as much authority as they do Massachusetts Health Department has a lot of authority and you see a lot of great regulations coming out of these places because they have the authority to enact them so because this is a health department regulation it only applies to the the vendors that they have jurisdiction over and in new york city that are food service establishments so the news has picked up this story as saying this is going to apply to fast food restaurants but not 7-eleven big gulp and that's all you hear is that new york city is why are they enacting this and no 7-eleven big gulp well it's because the the health department doesn't actually have authority over 7-elevens that's actually a state run um the state us the state agriculture department has authority over those types of stores so it's just that it's a, that's their authority um and so what's been very interesting in new york is that they have the the beverage industry are sending out people pretending to be grassroots movements saying let we pick our own drink on on the day that they were voting on this i saw men in white t-shirts i picked my own drink walking around. These are paid people. They're not actually grassroots movements. So the new term is, has come out called astroturfing, which is when you fake a grassroots movement. And um, that's what was going on. It's happening all around the country. Every time a sugary beverage tax, the, there's astroturf movements of pretend grassroots movement trying to c- convince people that they're taking away your liberty interests in being able to purchase a large beverage. Basically, whatever you think of this uh, proposal, Legally, there's not a problem. The major complaints are that um, the major legal complaint that could potentially be valid is that the health department has overstepped its bounds. But that's a real um, very New York City centric argument based on the case law. But legally, any jurisdiction could really enact this if they had the authority to do it. Um, and one of the great arguments, the, the movie theater industry does not like this at all because people tend to buy large beverages and share them which I spoke to the head of the company of the movie industry company and I said, well, just won't you make more money that people have to buy two? And he's, oh, I, I don't, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, but then they all yell about the slippery slope argument of what about popcorn is the big one that was talked about. Um, the reason why none of us are worried about the slippery slope argument is because there's absolutely no product that every study consistently shows is problematic for health. It's associated with weight gain, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. And the very different thing about sugary beverages is that your body does not compensate for the for the calories you consume through 
sugary beverages, which means you don't eat less. So if you eat eat the same amount of calories in food form, you would eat less uh, in your meal. But if you're drinking it through sugary beverages, the studies show that you actually don't eat any less. And the studies also show this to be the same uh, for fruit juice, uh, just as an FYI, even though that's not covered by the law. Um, And so... The sugary beverage taxes, there have been bills all over the city, all over the country, cities and states all over trying to pass sugary beverage taxes. Um, the federal government and all the states have the power to pass uh, excise taxes, and some local governments can as well. Um, the, in the Two years after the U.S. Constitution was ratified, the country passed the first excise tax on whiskey, and they've been passing excise taxes ever since. There's excise taxes on tons of stuff in this country. And then as I told you, every state and the federal government also taxes tobacco. Um, the, the benefit of an excise tax is that uh, you can, uh, you alter the price at the base. So it's not a sales tax that you would later find out when you got to the register, but it actually changes the base price of the product. And also you can earmark it, which means that you can dedicate the revenue stream to a specific cause. And those of us who work in public health, our whole goal is to dedicate it to public health, put the money back in communities that do suffer health disparities, maybe are, maybe do have consistent users of sugary beverages, and um, it, 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 would, it would basically make a tax to help the communities. Um, and then you, you'd have to learn from the tobacco world. When tobacco taxes were first instituted, all the tobacco companies started doing trade discounts, and um, you would you have to prohibit that in order to make the tax work. But this is something that um, our office talks about a lot. Uh, Kelly Brownell, our director, is kind of one of the most famous uh, proponents of the sugary beverage tax. Um, and then my final slide is about the SNAP program. So SNAP is uh, formerly known as food stamps. And um, right now, we have the largest amount of people on SNAP than ever before. One in seven people in the country receive SNAP. Um, and study, in our office, someone uh, did a study. There's, there's one, um, um, there's one uh, estimate that people spend four billion, that, I'm sorry, the government spends four billion dollars a year buying sherry beverages for SNAP recipients. And um, some, uh, some, the economists in our office did a study that showed it was um, 2.6 billion uh, in the new in the New England states, not including stores like Walmart and those stock stores. So the four billion does sound kind of right if you're if you're only talking about a small portion of the sugary beverages. So the argument is that. Um, SNAP is basically, uh, SNAP recipients can use their money for anything except for pre-prepared food, alcohol, tobacco, pet food, stuff like that, but they can buy anything. And so um, the WIC program, which is the Women, Infants, Children program, which is also a a food help program, they have restrictions, very strict restrictions on what recipients can purchase. And they actually, it's the strict nutritional criteria are pretty strong. And we found that the retail environments of the stores that accept WIC actually improved because of this. And so not only are people buying healthier food, but the retail environments got healthier. Um, So New York, Texas, and Minnesota tried to ask the USDA if they could pilot a study where they would withdraw sugary beverages from SNAP recipients. Uh, The USDA said no. The USDA is very uh, concerned about hunger and stigma. So the USDA's main argument is that it's stigmatizing to SNAP recipients to not be able to purchase everything that they want. Um, We had a representative from the USDA actually at our office last week who said this argument, but it, it, it it doesn't seem to connect with the fact that SNAP recipients do have their own money, and also it's the government purchasing the products. It's not actually the SNAP recipients. So nobody wants to stigmatize anybody, but our goal would be to have a study and not try to cut um, the benefits for SNAP recipients, which is one problem. Some of the conservative groups are latching onto this as a reason to cut SNAP, which is not really the greatest idea, especially when so many people are receiving it and light and a lot of people need it. Um, but rather to study whether this is stigmatizing, because that's a testable question, uh, and see, because it's, there, there is a pretty good case that maybe the government shouldn't be purchasing such a harmful product. You know, we now know this is harmful. Maybe it's not something to purchase just like tobacco. 
is um, so anyway if you I would love to answer any questions and our website has a ton of information and uh, all, all the studies I talked about so thank you uh, first I'd point out that children don't have a lot of disposable income so I would think that this is ultimately a problem with what the parents are buying um, Second, can you quantify how much of this demand for unhealthy food is driven by the advertising versus bad information in general versus the health claims that food companies are able to make because of the USD's okay? And so I wonder if you're putting the cart before the horse, if you're trying to limit advertising, if we've just got all this widespread bad information in the first place. Oh, I don't think limiting advertising is the solution to obesity or the food problem. I simply th think it's important that people know what children are seeing when they're when they're watching TV. I, what we found is parents have no idea what kids are seeing. And a lot of parents say that children request the foods that they've seen on TV. When they're in their stores, they're constantly begging for food. And I'm not saying that the parents don't have a responsibility, but I think as a, as a society, we might have a responsibility to our children to have a, an environment that doesn't foster such an unhealthy relationship with food and only the desire for unhealthy food. I think it's a challenge for parents to get their kids to eat healthy when they're being inundated with these kind of commercials. But for sure, there's no way that we would solve all obesity or food problems by just marketing alone. And no, I can't quantify that. I'm, I'm, I have a JD. I can't barely add. So, <laughs> Hi. Um, I just have an observation regarding SNAP and um, food stamps and WIC. Um, it's my understanding that WIC um, allows women, infants, and children to have access to things such as milk and bread and cereal. So it's, it's still, I mean, from, a, from the people here perspective, it's still not... Uh, a preferred approach. But then also, I've seen, at least in Seattle, we've got um, food stamp programs that are accessible through our farmer's market. So I would take issue with it being, um, WIC being better than food stamps from that perspective anyway. Oh yeah, that's it's a, a great program that the farmer's markets are accepting EBT. Um, I, I've, I think that it's a better program to have restrictions on not buying bad things, not telling people what to buy on the good list is not really where I'm at, but I would say restricting the most unhealthy products. And also, I'm not really sure it's the, listen, I'm as liberal as they come, but I don't know if it's the government's role to buy sugary beverages, which we now know are really harmful for people. The The thing I said about not comp, about people not compensating, I think is really important. If you're hungry and you drink sugary beverages, it's not satiating you. Whereas we're, we're trying to get food to people that are hungry so they can be sustained and healthy, whereas sugary beverages not only make you sick, but they don't actually make you feel that you've eaten or that you're sustained. So it's a pretty bad item. And by the way, energy drinks are also purchased, so purchasable. And these are not products that we would, that I feel that like government should be buying for hungry people. Has the Rudd uh, Center looked at the way Europe handles it? It seems like they have a they they just group sugar with tobacco and um, alcohol and and tax tax it like crazy. Um, seems like a good model for them. Uh, I've been over there and and people really think about buying sugar because it's really expensive or sugary products. Yeah, there's some great economists um, I think in Iowa who just modeled out taxing sugar itself instead of sugary beverages. I, I love that that model. Um, I th I think Europe's got it a lot better in a lot of ways. Um, but Kelly Brownell came up with this idea of sh taxing sugary beverages like 20 years ago, so he's really into it. Um, so they, the economists and the group that do the studies, they're really looking at sugary beverages. Although there are other economists in other places looking at tax. And if you email me, I could send you their studies because they're great studies. Um, I don't agree with Mary Nessel on much of anything, but um, she's uh, proposed this idea that we just remove health claims from food labels altogether. Um, and I've talked about that with people who do policy, and, and some of them have been like, well, what about the First Amendments, you know, freedom of speech, that, that, uh, that um, producers have the right to make these health claims if they can substantiate them according to whatever the policy level is. And I'm, I, I know that it's complicated and people are, you know, the, the, legis the, the laws behind that are, you know, whether you're claiming this versus claiming that, but I'm just wondering what you think about just no 
no health claims on labels. I, I agree, but I do that the First Amendment is a barrier here. So I, I think it would be better if, if we didn't have health claims because of what's happened now. But what happened was the FDA tried to restrict certain claims and uh, the District of Columbia's Court of Appeals said that they couldn't. Um, and that's the highest court that's looked at the issue. But they were looking at something called, um, they were looking at health claims that were qualified and they had all, and they were they weren't meeting the strict standard and the court said that they couldn't restrict them that they all they could do and this is consistent with the first amendment is include a disclaimer or explanatory language so now there's something called qualified health claims they're like two sentences long and not that many people not that many companies use it but it's they're very long ways of saying that we don't really have that much proof but this is what we think and so I would argue that that's confusing and misleading and deceptive right there. So we should be able to ban that. And I think that if you that we need to have studies showing consumers are misled, these are deceptive, then you can restrict them. If it's just saying this has is high in vitamin C, it's, it would be very it's impossible under the First Amendment and the current conception of the First Amendment to restrict it because especially this court feels that corporations have the right to say a lot. Um, and so if, but what we could do is get studies to show that they're confusing because deceptive speech is not protected. So that's the route that we could take. Um, so I agree with her. I saw her, her article on that. And then I wrote an article, something after it saying, well, if you could prove it's deceptive, then then we can, with, we can get them, get rid of them. So, um, to follow up. So what kind of barriers are there to doing these studies? Um, and I'm interested in the barriers, like what are the barriers and what can we do to try to get rid of them? The barriers is that we don't, that public health doesn't have any money. So we have to get, we have to get grants to run studies. And so there are some great groups, Robert Johnson, um, the NIH, they do give grants to groups to do these types of studies. They're, but that's the, that's the barrier. Um, and so, the other thing is the lawyers know this the, about the the deceptive, and then this the people who run studies might not. So we got to join. So the one beauty of our office is that we can jo join those two things, but we would have to get a grant to run the study. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you.